would like to uh, introduce our our musicians for the evening. Uh, if you could come up, please. Kina Nawi on the road and Tarek Rantisi in percussion. They will be joining us this evening for several segments. And uh, we will uh, start first. They will play a segment while uh, we show some images of Gaza from this past summer. Uh, these images are taken from a variety of photographers who are acknowledged uh, in the program as well. So we are very grateful for them for sharing them with us.
and would be doing everything in his power to awaken the conscience of the world, to demand an end to the perpetual human rights emergency in which Gazans are forced to live. Quote, our wounds in Gaza are still open, our justice still denied, end quote. Dr. El Sadaj wrote to President Obama in September 2009, nine months after Israel's operation cast lead reduced large portions of the Gaza Strip to rubble, and its draconian siege made it all but impossible to carry out the rebuilding process. The letter continues, quote, the war and the continued closure of the Gaza Strip have undermined the capacity of mothers and fathers to act as protectors and providers. As a community, we will struggle for decades to live with the consequences, end quote. I first met Dr. Iyad El Sarraj 26 years ago during an earlier phase of the human rights emergency. I was in Gaza as part of a fact-finding delegation soon after the first intifada began. And I will never forget the shock of seeing hospitals full of young men and children who had endured the, quote, forced might and beatings employed by the Israeli army to put down an unarmed civil uprising of the entire population. I'll never forget hearing screams and gunshots and the wailing of ambulances all night long. In 1988, and for the next five years, a 7 p.m. curfew was imposed on the Gaza Strip, and anyone who violated it could be shot. But Iyad El Sadaj was not about to abide by this military order. Instead, every evening, he would go where he was needed in his small car, giving solace and medical attention. He made no attempt to avoid the army convoys, but instead would purposefully go his way, sometimes with me in the passenger seat. So brazen was he in breaking the rules that the soldiers must have assumed to get a special permit, which he did not. What he did have was a determination to live in open, non-violent defiance of occupation both as an assertion of his own humanity and in recognition of the humanity of others, Israelis as well as Palestinians. There was a feature story about the Adel Sadaj in the Canadian magazine Equinox, published in February 1995, which illustrates this quality. Quote, he was once stopped during the Intifada and ordered by an Israeli soldier to extinguish flames from a burning tire with his bare hands. He refused the order. When the soldier threatened to take his identification card, El Sadaj didn't protest. Go ahead, take it, I don't care, he said. And when the soldier threatened to beat him, El Sadaj said, go ahead, but before you do, I know there is a real human being behind that uniform and I would like you to show me that person. The soldier got tears in his eyes, and then he just walked away, end quote. How was it possible to maintain sanity under the dehumanizing conditions of occupation? When the first intifada was at its peak, Iyad set about creating a center that would work to overcome the stigma attached to mental illness and provide family and community-based treatment on a huge scale. In 1990, he opened the Gaza Community Mental Health Program, which soon had clinics in the refugee camps. Before long, it had established a range of training programs, crisis intervention programs, special projects that worked with children and people who had been victims of torture. He had an empowerment women's program and a training and education department offering courses for teachers and nurses, as well as a postgraduate diploma in community mental health and human rights. I learned a lot about the hopes and aspirations of Palestinians in Gaza when I taught a course in human rights law to the diploma students, which included drawing up a constitution for the future Palestine. I would now like to introduce someone who has been a close friend of Dr. Iyad Siraj over the decades and serves as a trustee of the Gaza Mental Health Foundation. Sarah Roy, who is a senior research scholar at Harvard Center for Middle Eastern Studies, is an extraordinary researcher and 
writer. Among her more than 100 publications are groundbreaking works about the Gaza Strip, including the Gaza Strip, the Political Economy of Dedevelopment, and the award-winning Hamas and Civil Society in Gaza, Engaging the Islamist Social Sector, which was published by Princeton University Press in 2001. Sarah, would you please come up? No, you will never get permission. And 
And when you are inside the hospital, you will understand why. I shall bring you in because you must see for yourself the conditions of the hospital. Yeah, you can get into serious trouble with the authorities. You might lose your job. I don't want you to take such risks for me, and I'm not asking you to do so. I'm not worried, he said, but you must write about what you see, about everything I show you. A considerable risk to himself, and it was only later from others that I learned how great the risk actually was. Iyad surreptitiously brought me into Shiva, walking me through the entire hospital, including the operating room. He allowed me to take as much time as I needed, despite the worried looks of the hospital staff. He did not say too much, but he did not have to. Conditions inside the hospital were appalling, as the following excerpt from my published report, the Gaza Strip survey, shows, and I quote myself. Mice, roaches, and other insects were observed scurrying through individual wards, rooms, and bathrooms. Rooms were extremely dirty and in a state of decay, as indicated by broken windows, healing paint and cracked floors. Hospital beds were old and rusty, and patients were observed two to a bed, lying on sheets that were torn and bloodstained. Hospital personnel indicated that the same sheets are often used for more than one patient due to a lack of supplies. Rooms are cleaned only when patients can afford to pay. The surgical operating room was in a similar state of deterioration and extremely unsterile. Cigarette butts were observed on the floor of the OR. This one paragraph caught the attention of the international media and a firestorm ensued, including a four-minute segment on life inside Gaza on the ABC Evening News. Ia told me that the Palestinian director of the hospital was fired and that, the hosp and that hospital conditions soon improved, but only temporarily. After Shifa was cleaned and repaired, the military government invited various international groups and organizations into the hospital as a way of refuting my claims. The Knesset even threatened to subpoena Marone and me since they accused us of having been paid by the PLO to write the report. I was often asked how I got access to the hospital, which I never revealed until now. I remember receiving a call in Boston from a senior official at the American Embassy in Tel Aviv, who surprised that I managed um, to get into Shiva, asked me whether I had seen dogs running through the hospital as he had when he was last there. Many people thanked me for exposing the conditions in Shiva, but it was Yad who was truly responsible for doing so. Yad was an extremely principled man, and he did not fear retribution for actions he believed in. I remember another time, years later, sitting with him in the garden of his home. It was the spring of 1996, and not long before he had been appointed the Commissioner General of the Palestinian Independent Commission for Citizens' Rights. Yad was very upset about the behavior of the Palestinian Authority in Gaza and its increasingly flagrant abuse of human rights. But what outraged him most, it seemed to me, was the facile, almost effortless nature of the PA's abuse the ease with which they oppressed their own people, and the total lack of remorse that defined their abuse. His anger was palpable, but so were his pain and the feeling that his beloved Gaza had been betrayed once again. He told me how he was going to publicly expose the PA in an effort to initiate a process of reform. I remember feeling anxious and tense, fearing, I told him, his arrest and possible torture which is what subsequently happened. Yad, however, remained consistent and unwavering, telling me that silence is no option. In the near three decades of our friendship, I came to know Yad very well. There are few people for whom I have more respect, admiration, and affection. I always learned from his example. He was, as others have written, long and deeply committed to addressing trauma, especially in children, and to protecting and honoring the dignity of the individual, irrespective of religion or nationality. For me, Iyad's most important legacy lies in one fundamental belief which animated his life. While resistance to oppression can assume many forms, the most powerful form of resistance 
resides and maintains one's humanity in the presence of cruelty and is seeking that humanity in others, including in one's oppressors. Such resistance, he believed, can never be extinguished.
undergo uh, medical treatment in Amsterdam in the United States, still suffers from it, but he constantly returns. Uh, he returns to record what is happening and the resilience of the population. Uh, the most, there's only one really important comment that I'd like to make, and that is that we're responsible for this. Uh, we are the ones who are responsible for the shameful record of atrocities that's directly with our tax dollars and indirectly, but very significantly, through our failure to uh, put an end to the decisive uh, support for these crimes by the United States in many dimensions, military, economic, diplomatic, and uh, ideological, not least, namely in permitting the uh, imagery of Israeli propaganda to prevail uh, in the United States. Fortunately, not many other places, but in the United States, the image of Israel, the victim, the pathetic victim of uh, the Palestinian population, the most evil of them in Gaza, who are dedicated to uh, destroy Israel, which only hopes to live in peace. Uh, this, uh, this image is, uh, adds to the humiliation and uh, degradation of a brutalized population who see themselves turned into the perpetrators of the terror and violence. Uh, the last time I met Muhammad was actually at Bayad's home in Gaza. I was there visiting with my friend, Asaf <coughs> Furi. We had been invited by Bayad uh, to visit. Uh, and, uh, among other things, he, he, he was in his health was already in serious decline. The picture of the uh, uh, announcement uh, describes it uh, as a picture of uh, a meeting that he organized and moderated uh, in Gaza. At his home, uh, he and his friend Roger Sorani, a marvelous person, uh, described the uh, conditions of life in Gaza, the uh, pressure cooker, as they described it, which is, looks as though it's about to explode at any moment, and the amazing fact that there isn't a massive explosion of rage and violence. But when I spoke to Muhammad a couple of days ago, and he gave me Another typical update is he has a six-year-old child who was in the hospital for dehydration because there was no water. There was no water to drink. It will destroy the sewage plants, the power plants. There won't allow chemicals in. Uh, so his six-month-old son is hospitalized for dehydration. Uh, the, uh, he described how in the region, especially in the parts of Gaza, that were virtually devastated by Hanun. Uh, people are trying to survive outdoors in a cold, uh, driving rain or in uh, hovels that have been broken and beaten into ruins. Uh, but they continue somehow. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, I was there, uh, myself and I were there, uh, shortly after we were also there to lecture at the uh, Islamic University which has been a regular target of Israeli attacks on pretexts to ludicrous disgust that are accepted here. Uh, again, in the most recent uh, episode this summer of uh, Israel's uh, shooting fish in the pond, uh, using advanced weaponry, which we were gracious enough to provide them with. to keep 
keep them at the bare level of survival, it wouldn't look good if they all starved to death. So the animals have to be kept just barely alive. Uh, the Israeli violence is constant, never stops. Uh, but it's punctuated every once in a while by an episode of what Israel calls mowing the lawn and to teach the prisoners not to raise their heads and to submit to the occupation. Now this is considered legitimate in the United States because uh, the victims are what George Orwell would call unpeople, uh, not worthy of uh, our concern. In fact, appropriate for us to help kill. Uh, that can't remain under Israeli occupation, this is not a doubt. It's accepted by the world outside of Israel, even by the United States. Well, our visit. Nancy said it was in October 2012. A couple of weeks later, uh, Israel decided to mow the lawn again. Uh, that was Operation Pillar of Cloud, as always, on Lewis's pretext, as always, except here. Uh, after the appropriate dose of uh, violence and humiliation, uh, Israel agreed to a ceasefire, which repeated the usual terms. Uh, here they are cessation of military action by both sides, and the effective ending of the siege of Gaza, with Israel opening the crossings, facilitating the movements of people and transfer of goods, and refraining from restricting residents' free movements and, targeted, uh, and targeting the residents in the border areas, and end of all of that. Those are the terms, the normal ones. Uh, what followed next, Tom, simply quote from uh, highly respected, maybe the most respected uh, independent analyst of the Middle East, uh, analyst of the International Crisis Group, uh, Nathan Thrall. He says that Israeli intelligence recognized that Hamas was observing the terms of the ceasefire. Uh, Israel therefore saw little incentive in upholding its end of the deal in the three months following the ceasefire, its forces made regular incursions into Gaza, strafed Palestinian farmers, and those collecting scrap and rubble across the border, fired boats, preventing fishermen from accessing the majority of Gaza's water. They're forced to fish a couple of kilometers offshore and completely polluted water after the sewage system and get power system been destroyed by Israeli attacks. Uh, crossings were repeatedly shut. So buffer zones inside Gaza were reinstated. These are zones in which Palestinians are barred. They constitute maybe a third or more of Gaza's limited Arab land. Continuing to quote thrall, imports declined, exports were blocked, fewer Gazans were given exit permits to Israel and the West Bank. Well, so matters continued for 18 months until uh, April of this year when a very important event took place. A unity government was formed between Hamas and the Gaza Strip and the Fatah Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Uh, and this was a remarkable uh, agreement Hamas had actually been trying to reach it many years, Hamas made major concessions that the unity government contained no Hamas members or allies. Uh, Hamas even turned over a large part of the government of Gaza to the Palestinian West Bank Palestinian Authority. Uh, and remember that Hamas was the victor in the one free election that has ever taken place, not only in Palestine, but in the Arab world. Uh, get back to that. Uh, the unity government accepted the, the three conditions that Washington and the European Union have repeatedly demanded nonviolence, adherence to past agreements, and the recognition of Israel. Uh, never reported is the fact that Israel, of course, rejects all the three conditions completely. Adherence to past agreements is a bad joke, and there is what's called a road 
man to peace proposed by George W. Bush and the international community. Uh, Israel accepted it, but once added 14 conditions, reservations, which completely undermined it. In fact, it was never reported to me until uh, Jimmy Carter included the details in the appendix to his piece of apartheid book. And of course, uh, Israel not only doesn't recognize Palestine, but the electoral program of the governing party declares explicitly that there can never be any self-determination for Palestinians and your former Palestine, West of Jordan. And they incidentally regard Jordan as a Palestinian state, as does the opposition Labour Party. Uh, well, uh, Israel was uh, infuriated by the unity government agreement. It declared at once that it would not deal with the uh, with the unity government, and it terminated the pretty meaningless negotiation. And their fury mounted even further when most of the world supported the unity government, including even the United States. Uh, there are very good reasons why uh, Israel objects to unification of Gaza and the West Bank. One reason is that uh, the lack of unity had offered pretext for evading negotiations and how can you negotiate with the conflicted parties. That's one. But a more serious problem uh, is obvious when you look at a map. Take a look at a map and you can see right away that any uh, small regions within the West Bank that might ultimately be granted some kind of autonomy uh, are completely imprisoned. On the one hand, the other side is Israel, on the other side, the Jordanian dictatorship, uh, both of them allies of the United States, and of course, extremely hostile to the Palestinians. The Gaza offers one outlet to the outside world, so therefore, it's not surprising for the, that for the past more than 20 years, uh, Israel, with U.S. backing, has been seeking to keep them separate in violation, incidentally, of the uh, terms of the Oslo Agreement 20 years ago, which uh, declared them to be an inseparable territorial unity. Uh, the, uh, and furthermore, Israel has been systematically taking over the Jordan Valley and driving out Palestinian inhabitants, farmers, and shepherds, others, uh, bringing in Jewish settlers, uh, sinking wells, creating military zones from which uh, Palestinians were excluded, the ultimately Jewish settlements were established, and in general moving step by step to integrate this region, about a third of the West Bank, uh, into what the greater Israel they're busy constructing. And that means that uh, any autonomous cantons that might be left to Palestinians will be multiply imprisoned. So with only, and of course this would be undermined if there was a connection to that. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, incidentally, this is supported by all the major political blocs, including uh, uh, the so-called doves, uh, Shimon Peres, former president, uh, hailed here as the leading dove, who was in fact one of the primary architects of uh, Israeli settlement, the settlement, of course, deep inside Gaza, deep inside the West Bank. Well, the, uh, returning to the unity agreement last April, uh, Israel responded by launching a huge wave of repression, uh, primarily in the West Bank, also in Gaza, uh, targeting Hamas, uh, as always. There was a pretext, uh, pretext uh, collapses very quickly on examination, and as always, it was accepted here. And finally, the repression did elicit a limited response reaction, which was the pretext for launching uh, Operation Preventive Edge, which you just saw uh, by far the most uh, murderous and uh, savage of uh, Israel's attacks on gas. Uh, what I've just described is a pattern that is uniform uniform, repeated over and over. It takes genius for the press not to perceive that what happens over and over is that a ceasefire is established, Israel completely ignores it, Hamas lives up to it, as Israel can 
seeds until the unremitting Israeli violence escalates sharply, at which point there sometimes is a Hamas reaction and a pretext for the next episode of mowing along. Uh, this has been going on with a long and bitter history, which I'll skip. But this pattern has been going on since November 2005. November 2005, there was an agreement called the Agreement on Movement and Access uh, between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. I'll close to paraphrase it. Uh, it established a crossing between Gaza and Egypt at Rafah for the export of goods and the transit of people. Continuous operation of crossings between Israel and Gaza for the import and export of goods and the transit of people, the reduction of obstacles to movement within the West Bank, bus and truck convoys between the West Bank and Gaza, the building of the seaport of Gaza, and reopening of the airport of Gaza that Israel had destroyed. Now, those are essentially the terms of the successive ceasefires, including the recent one last August 26. Uh, the timing of this uh, uh, agreement is important. It was timed at the moment of the so-called Israeli disengagement from Gaza. Uh, that's portrayed by Israeli propaganda and uh, loyally repeated here as a noble effort to uh, achieve uh, peace and open the way to the development of Gaza. The reality is radical. that all that would have been 
and he was committed a real crime. But there was a free election, open, carefully monitored free election, and they voted the wrong way. The Hamas took control of the parliament. Now, the U.S. and Israel do not, they believe in democracy, but only if it comes out the right way. This uh, instantly led to a sharp escalation of uh, the siege, the violence, the Israeli siege and violence. Now, the U.S. totally supported it. The U.S. Uh, also uh, uh, initiated plans to, uh, have to, to carry out a military coup to overthrow the elected government. That again is quite normal. Uh, Hamas actually preempted the coup uh, and blocked it. The way that's described in the United States is that Hamas took over the Gaza Strip by force, which is not false, but something rather critical is omitted. Well, going back to the disengagement of the Israeli uh, tale, as usual, adopted here, is that Israel was immediate. It, Israel had offered Gaza this wonderful opportunity to develop for development, but instead Hamas immediately launched a torrent of rockets at defenseless Israel. So what did they do? Actually, there was one rocket which landed of unknown origin, which landed somewhere in the field harmlessly. That's the tarn of rockets before the escalation of January and the reaction to the January election. Uh, the, uh, uh, I, I won't review the rest of the story. It's the same throughout the pattern. It's very uh, uh, And uh, for the moment, it seems to be continuing. There was the latest ceasefire on August 26th. Usual terms, uh, Israel was instantly violated. It, it uh, at once announced uh, the biggest land grab in uh, 30 years, uh, 1,000, roughly 1,000 acres in Gush Etzion, with a couple of dozen Israeli settlements, which is legal uh, in what Israel calls Greater Jerusalem, a huge area, which has nothing to do with Jerusalem in the past, takes them all the West Bank. Uh, this is The U.S. State Department informed the Israeli embassy that Israeli settlement activity in Gush Etzion undermined American efforts to protect Israel at the United Nations and urged that Israel not provide ammunition, ammunition for those of the U.N. who would interpret Israel's position as partner. That's almost correct. Not quite. That, uh, Warning was actually 47 years ago. Uh, in uh, September 1967, uh, when Israel began its illegal settlement activities, now, very little has changed since, except for the scale of the crimes, uh, which continue and continue to escalate uh, without a break, and will continue as long as the United States continues to support them. Uh, the best tribute we can pay to this remarkable person who we're honoring tonight, the Yatsarada, would be to devote ourselves to bringing these horrible crimes to an end. Thank you so much. Dr. Jess Ghanem, a Palestinian psychiatrist, from the University of California at San Francisco was supposed to be with us tonight, but at the very last moment, he had to go on a Gaza-related mission. Uh, he, I am very sorry, isn't here because he's perhaps worked more closely with the ad in his professional capacity than anyone else in the United States. He sent us this message, which I will now read. Um, he is pictured up there. This is a trip he just made to Gaza. So here is what he said. Let me begin by thanking the organizers for their tireless effort in making this important, important event happen. My special thanks go to Drs. Nancy Murray and Bill Slaughter for their dedication over the years to the work of the Gaza Community Mental Health Program. It is also quite an honor to share the stage with Professors Chomsky and Roy, both of whom I have admired.
admired for some time. It is unfortunate that I cannot be with you in person this evening, but I hope my brief remarks will add something to the life and legacy of Dr. Ian El Salaj. I have known and worked with Ian for over two decades. Whenever I think about Ian or speak about him, the word heroic always comes up. Because of my unique and privileged background as a Palestinian, I was able to see the truly heroic nature of Iyad's work, his place, and his vision. I first stumbled upon Iyad when I went to Gaza in 1992, just before the signing of the ill-fated Oslo Accords. At that time, you could walk and drive to Gaza from the West Bank. Also at that time, there were three psychiatrists for 1.3 million Palestinians in Gaza. It was during those initial conversations with Ia that the vision for the GCMHP, that's the Gaza Community Mental Health Program, was articulated and implemented, and where I spent the ensuing 20 plus years teaching and supervising in the Community Mental Health Diploma Program that eventually graduated hundreds of mental health workers for Gaza. It was Iyad's vision and leadership that made this a reality. This was not, however, the heroic side of Iyad. The heroic side came from his insistence on staying in Gaza when he could have left and lived a far more comfortable life in the West. He remained in Gaza throughout wars, invasions, bombings, internal strife, imprisonment, torture, and his own demise. He was not a partisan, and he took many unpopular stances. He never hesitated to criticize any manifestation of injustice. He was steadfast until his last breath. My fondest memories of the end are when we would go to the beach in Gaza. He would take his morning swim, and I would watch. These quiet moments brought him so much pleasure. He loved Palestine and was dedicated to making Palestine a place of equality and justice for all. I was in Gaza this past December and January and paid my condolences to his family. Gaza feels so empty without him. Now, with an entire community trying to cope with loss and extreme traumatic exposure, I hope that any attempt to honor his life and legacy will involve supporting GCMHP and continuing to create even more opportunities to have EF's vision realized. Thank you. So 
Ian Brady, as we've heard a lot tonight, he's articulated the challenge of facing, um, of supporting people face psychiatric, their individual psychiatric needs, but also the collective need for human rights. Um, and so, for example, in an interview at the very beginning of the Gaza Community Health uh, Program in the 1990s, Ian said, and I quote, the problem is, how can you reach all the people? We have at least 70,000 Palestinians who were tortured by Israel during the Intifada. And that is a huge number. If you take into account the limited resources we have in terms of manpower, experience, and so on, it is almost impossible. So from the very beginning, the Gaza Community Mental Health Program was charged with the impossible. To address the needs of tens of thousands, now millions of people living under over several generations, in conditions of extreme crisis, vulnerability, locked down by siege and closure, where refugees cannot escape attack through the blockade, and because as we've seen just recently, UN shelters, clinics, hospitals, homes, streets, all our targets, uh, and sites of massacre. In my research on trauma and resilience in Palestinian refugee families, it's clear how we're struggling for the right to life. Despite being attacked and their resources drained, Palestinian families are forced to make difficult decisions, sacrifices, forced to protect safety and also access to key resources uh, such as water, electricity, food, mobility, shelter, health care, uh, religion, education, employment, political representation, family togetherness, tolerable living spaces, a place to play, and so on and on and on and on, of course. So searching for safety is inseparable to the quest for the right to place, the right to have a place. Of course, safety is critical, but even in times when Palestinian families are being bombed by war planes, or even, let's say, when the tanks have stopped and are pulling away, when the smoke of the sniper, the sniper's gun has risen and thinned, Palestinians are still denied the right to dig in. So in this light, my research shows how families are obligated to not only protect bodies and resources, but also psychological integrity, their wholeness as full human beings not racialized and subjugated others who just happen to be land and stateless without history, hope, humanity. No. We can reject the notion that Palestinians are empty bodies. Not, they do not own a ceasefire. Palestinians are not evacuees in need of resettlement and should not have to depend on UN foreign aid. Instead, the emphasis should be placed on any of the occupation, lived in the siege, Erodian justice as the most imperative and immediate remedy to increase Palestinian family mental health and healing, healing from the trauma that is not past, the trauma is continuous. Palestinians face violence in the present that is always a reminder of violence past and violence to come. So the intensity is devastating, and part of our work can also, of course, be contributing not only to the God of the Human Health Program, and, and, but also to ending the occupation in our work here. Um, and part of our support for the God of the Human Health Program shows uh, really how important it is to strengthen the, the mental health system from the ground up uh, in Palestine. Uh, Ian talks at length about the importance of even developing the Department of Mental Health
in the mental health field in the Gaza Strip. And he's going to come up and introduce a message to us from the Gaza Community Mental Health Program and then add some thoughts about why supporting its work is so critical at the present time. Bill. Peace is the answer. 
just is the key. We are not only clinicians in the rooms, we are also advocates for justice and human rights. We need an overall, an overall decent human rights structure to benefit our whole people. So we clinicians here can stop the exhausting work of individual new horrendous case after individual new horrendous case. That is no solution. Now GCHP rule is needed more than ever. The suffering is huge. We have to dignify the dead people. And the most important is to take care of those who are alive. We are responding with crisis intervention, where we visit families affected by the work and provide them with psychological first aid and refer cases who need further specialized intervention for community centers. We also train many other professionals with many other organizations who don't have so much counseling background working in the community and supervise the work. We also educate the general public about how to deal with their agonies and problems. We try to help the Palestinian family to be powerful and cohesive to increase their resiliency. We need your support to be able to help our people and to build peace in Palestine and try to prevent further cycles of violence. Dr. Ia has taught us that the core goal of GCHP is to make people feel like they are regaining their dignity. This is why we see ourselves as community workers and human rights advocates, not just clinicians. Once again, thank you. Thank you all tonight. Thank you, Gaza Matter Foundation. Thank you all our friends and supporters in the States. Thank you for all your efforts to help us. Helping one human really helps all of us worldwide.
QWS, clearly, but everybody's traumatized. But the Gaza Community Mental Health staff has the advanced training and has really seeped in the toughest cases, making them the go-tos in the strip for the most horrific and entrenched situations beyond other helpers. Public health, YouTube, radio programming, teaching coping, it's the chief ongoing trainer and coach of the strip for psycho-emotional distress, working closely with those three broad public sectors that I mentioned to spread their expertise out through lesser trained folks, even the grassroots organization levels. Examples of myriad public education materials uh, that they put out um, include four recent initiatives developed with and coaching all teachers and parents throughout the strip on uh, anti-bullying, body-mind health approaches, conflict resolution, best parenting with all children and parents locked in collective psychological confinement or siege. Um, in any, of course, of our U.S. healthcare offices, slavery, Holocaust, native genocide, echo, with new now global war and in individual cases. Here, we have trauma, when we have traumatized folks, we basically are trying to ease them back into um, an overall le legal rights and social matrix. Not minimizing now our Ferguson, certainly. We do, we here do have a central core equality vision along our history, all created equal, regardless of religion, ethnicity, and race. This undergirding, really, equal legal and human rights infrastructure doesn't exist for people currently locked in Gaza. For any Palestinians regionally, as many of you know very well and personally, wave of individual after individual trauma, but no basic rights undergirding to present, prevent some inequities and ease all those individual cases back into it. AI and now Yasser have to work constantly unlocking the fundamental rights simultaneously with individual clinical care. Rights are key to all of our individual health. We here, U.S. civil society, clearly have to struggle to maintain and really grow our decency as a society. We have special responsibility, as Dr. Chomsky said, given our regional stance until now to ally with those community mental health programs, public health and rights work as the officer asks, with all decently assertive civil rights groups throughout the region, in that broad middle that's between those pushing aggressive lockdown and killing on the one hand, and on the other, those kind of whispering about passive subservience and giving up. Lastly now, the number one request of training, Gaza Community Mental Health students, the Oma program that's been mentioned, and staff, Red Crescent Crisis Team, the UN strip-wide training of all the three of those fields I laid out, when I've been able to get in, we were talking about that before, about half the time I've tried, all this difficult. Um, the most requested training is how to bring people out of chronic, very entrenched nightmare hell. Right? Yasser left out of this video, but I recently told him the day after this major attack, and he said it's okay to, to talk about this with caring people. So. Um, if you looked at the summer media reports, you might have heard about this family slaughter. You've seen the coverage of those 28 family deaths, the biggest single loss in one bomb of this summer. The kids' bodies, being especially small, were really blown apart. So the family did its best to get the right parts buried together, but they were really just scrambling, all right? Because attacks were continuing all around at that point, and they knew they weren't getting it quite right. They felt terrible about that. This is the, an example of the stuff of nightmares for everybody there. And I'm a little concerned about it personally, uh, seeing other people being so close to AI. And you know, healthcare, or my field is into research and evidence. The clearly, repeatedly best proven help for chronic nightmares is changing bad plots to good. People who listen, care, they listen to a person's repeat horrific night trauma narrative and support that person to change the story to what they really want the dream to be. Okay? How they want that stuck nightmare to change to a better, really best ending. 
One counselor, for instance, told a girl changing explosions to peaceful flowering. I right? don't see a lot of that there, but that's what she came up with. Better sleep almost always come, comes, and then waking life improves too when you work with that. But in Gaza, that never ending flood of new cases coming at the helpers, insidious deprivation daily since 1948. Big upticks in 67, 07 fighting, 08, 09, 12 this summer. This is obviously in context of chronic regional collective nightmares, chronic cycles of violence. This in context now really bloody ripples outward throughout the whole world, including obviously right here. Now Bin Laden tried to twist things towards a certain response, really focusing on Palestine, if you read it, uh, where he never been actually. But let's us, let's us here unlock something different. Our social history here in the U.S. has been as deeply twisted as Israel-Palestine. Oppressor and oppressed uh, thought naturally fully separate back in slavery days, but neither oppressor nor oppressed of us were really fully human in that unhuman distortion until one of us, at a critical time of Bedlam, and division about 50 years ago acted as a societal counselor, helped us renew our founding dream in the U.S. of equality, reminded us of Thomas Land, where Gaza is, going up a mountain, remember Stone Mountain, Georgia, some of you remember, some of you don't, reminds me kind of of the Temple Mount, perhaps, leading us all, all our society up the mountain, where little boys and girls as opposed as possible then, we thought, black and white. How come more opposite can that be, right? Held hands. Held hands. We've been, of course, the way, way biased counselor in the Gaza region. Let's change our U.S. role by giving the Gaza community mental health tonight for individual and rights level work. Let's support counseling out of the regional and for us in the U.S., really collective, current, global nightmare of divisions, religiously and so on, to respect for all, all equally, regardless of religion or ethnicity, really across our Abrahamic lineage. Now, Yasser spells out how giving tonight there helps all of us. Certainly, we in the U.S. are as trapped globally as folks are locked in Gaza, and our support now lets that key that Yasser has behind him, lets it work on all levels really of entrapment and inequity, the key to sleeping and living well for all of us. Right? Now let me introduce again, let's show our appreciation now as they come up for Kina Nawi and Tarakan Tisi's music to really deeply stir us uh, at this point again with another slideshow. The baskets have gone around, I believe. Be in touch with us if you like. Our group can use a couple volunteers if anybody's interested. And after the slideshow of music, Nancy will talk again. Thank you very much. As the musicians come up, let me just say something about the person who took these slides. We wanted to end with something more positive. Been a very difficult way to frame uh, the work in us. Everything has been so dark and so catastrophic. So we asked Tanya Haduka. She is an award winning Jordanian born photographer who has been based in East Jerusalem. She hoped to be here, but she could not make it. But the reason we asked her, you might have seen in the New York Times earlier this year uh, a feature about Tanya. She has produced a book about stereo, stereotype defying book called Palestinian Pleasures, which shows another side of Palestine and another side of Gaza where she spent much time. So we're going to see some of those pictures, some of those images, and listen again to these wonderful musicians. Thank you.
September 2008, he wrote an urgent appeal to end the Israeli siege of the Gaza Strip in the form of an open letter to Americans of conscience. There are copies back there. I hope you take one. Quote, I hope that you will not stand silently by while the people of Gaza are deprived of their dignity and all the basic requirements for a decent life. I hope you will understand that the kind of collective punishment that Gazans have endured since June 2007 is morally wrong and a serious violation of international humanitarian law. The siege is not just killing the spirit, and in some cases the lives of Gazans, it is also destroying all hopes for a peaceful future in the region." End quote. It is now six years since he wrote that letter, and astonishingly, the siege is still in place. Palestinians in Gaza are now once again living in the rubble of their homes, schools, hospitals, and smashed infrastructure, unable to access building materials. We all have a part to play in instilling hope. We can work to change U.S. foreign policy, and we can work to let Gaza live. I mean, this really is our responsibility, as Professor Chomsky said. So please contact the Obama administration. I have uh, back there some contact information. Say that the siege of Gaza, which has now lasted for eight years, must be brought to an end. Um, I would like now to thank everyone for coming. I would urge those of you who knew Dr. Iyad personally to come through to the parlor. All of you should come, but have refreshments and let's talk some more about this remarkable man. Please, through the door here, there's refreshments from the restaurant Asituna, and we, join, uh, we invite you all to join us. Thank you very much.